Well, you've decided to build an X299 system. I can't talk you out of it. Hopefully you're not buying a four core or even a six core CPU for X299. Hopefully you're building something with an 810, maybe 12 core. Number processing, serious number crunching, and computer science student, computer scientist, computer science enthusiast, whatever you happen to be. All right, let's build an X299 system. The parts that I've selected for this build is an MSI X299 SLI Plus. This is a great socket 2066 motherboard that's middle of the road in terms of features, value, not, uh, you know, not crazy expensive, but a pretty decent motherboard for X299, especially the eight or the 10 core CPU. I've also selected G-Skill Trident Z RGB memory. The specific kit is in the link in the description below, but it's DDR4 3600. It's a kit of four. So we're gonna be using quad channel as was meant to be the case with X299. We're gonna be using a Founders Edition GTX 1080, uh, maybe a 1080 Ti, depending on which one's available for the for the build. I'm not sure, 1080, 1080 Ti. You get a really good deal on the 1080s. I mean, I've seen them as cheap as like $400, $450. So it's, a, it's hard to pass that up. The 1080 Ti, because it's the flagship card, it's a lot harder to catch it on sale, but uh, you know, come what may, it's fine. We're gonna be using a Western Digital 256 gig SSD for now until something else is on sale. 256 gigs is really not all that big, but maybe I can combine a mechanical drive with Intel Optane or something like that so I can have a really nice fast, you know, four terabyte storage area. For the CPU, I'm gonna be using an Intel Core i9-7900X. Uh, That's the 10 core CPU. We're gonna see how that runs with the Corsair H115i in terms of power dissipation and things like that. The other thing that we're really curious about is heat production of the VRM area with this particular motherboard. So we're gonna put all this together, let's get started. First, we're gonna need our case. This is the Corsair Carbide 400C. It's a very nice attractive case. It doesn't have any externally accessible five and a quarter inch bays, but honestly that does not bother me in the least. It's got plenty of room for three and a half inch hard drives, and two and a half inch SSDs. It's got a nice plastic side panel and it's not insanely expensive. This particular one I picked up on sale at Micro Center, so I got a deal. So it worked out pretty well. This case is also an absolute joy to build in. My only real complaint is that it's only got two USB 3.0 headers on the top. I'd like to see this panel like user replaceable or an updated version of this case with more USB connectivity or USB type C or whatever. They probably have a more expensive version that people are already sending me messages about but gosh darn it, I got a good deal on this case. So now the first thing that I like to do, even before mounting the motherboard in the case, is install the CPU and the memory in the motherboard. Now when you're installing the CPU, the thing to keep in mind is don't drop the CPU into the socket. If you do anything untoward the CPU socket, you will damage the pins inside the socket and chances are nothing will ever work or nothing will ever work properly and stably. There's a little carrot, a little triangle on the CPU socket. There's a similar gold triangle in the corner of the CPU. Basically that tells you which way to rotate the CPU before you very gently set it down in the socket. I like to sort of wiggle it around a little bit once you actually set it down in the socket, just sort of you know shake it a little bit once it's actually on the pins. You can sort of feel metal scraping on metal because there's like you know a quarter of a millimeter of play there. Uh, I found that doing that makes sure that everything is latched properly because sometimes just setting it in there it can be off a little bit and it will let you clamp the socket. But in having assembled a lot of a lot of systems, doing that little trick seems to help a little bit. Installing the memory was pretty easy. This is, you know, our Trident Z kit. One thing that I noticed, I think on X99, this the memory was facing in opposite directions. So it was almost like the memory was rotated. Uh, but on X299, the memory is all facing the same direction. So take care when you're installing the memory to make sure that you don't install it backwards. Uh, it won't really fit backwards, but if you've got it kind of like half wedged in there, uh, very bad things can happen if you turn the system on with the memory sort of wedged the wrong way. But with this set up, we're basically ready to mount this inside the case. Now, if I found a tower CPU cooler or something other than the closed loop water cooler, I think I'd probably wanna go ahead and mount that as well. But since I've got the closed loop water cooler, we're just gonna go ahead and mount this in the, in the case and, and sort of go from there. So the first step with installing your motherboard is to install the IO shield without cutting yourself. Now for this build, I've gone ahead and mounted the power supply and routed my cable. So you can see I've got my ATX 24 pin power cable here. I've also got the eight pin CPU power up in the corner there. That's my VGA cables hanging out down there at the bottom, the, the power for the VGA adapter, whatever graphics card we end up in there. Now, normally I would recommend that you turn this case on the side 
and you mount the motherboard in the horizontal configuration, but because I don't have a camera person right now, and I don't have an overhead camera because I'm using the boom for something else right now, we're going to just do it vertically, which is probably okay. One of the standoffs in this case is actually a peg, so if you get the motherboard on the peg, it's pretty easy. Now, as expected, because of the peg, installing the motherboard really wasn't too bad. I'm just going to use a couple screws to tack it down, but you would want to go around the motherboard and screw in all the screws and make sure all the screws are screwed in if you were building the system for real. You also want to make sure the front panel wires are where you can get to them. There's uh, cables for power reset and other front panel controls on the top that are built into your case. And now it's where you would consult the, the manual, look for a diagram in the motherboard manual um, about the front of the case and the, the buttons and things like that to figure out how to hook those up. When hooking up the front panel, you just have to be careful about the polarity for the LEDs. The LEDs, if you get it backwards, the light won't work. So if you hook it up and your hard drive light or your power light doesn't come on, but everything else seems to be working normally, check and make sure that you've got the, the LEDs plugged in backwards. It's not really a big deal if you plug in the power LED or the hard drive LED backwards. The power switch and the reset switch, doesn't really matter which way you plug those in. Those are not really polarity specific. And of course, hooking up the HD audio front panel connector is pretty easy. It's keyed, so you can only plug it in one way. It goes in the HD audio connector on the motherboard. Now, one feature MSI has added to this motherboard to make it easier for you to know what's going on with your PCI Express lanes is LED colors next to the PCIe slots. So for your by 16 slots, there is an LED that tells you red by 16, meaning that the slot is operating in by 16 mode, and white, which is telling you that it's operating in by 8 by 4 or by 1 mode. There are also eight LEDs, one above each memory slot, and that will tell you which memory modules the motherboard sees installed. If you have an LED that does not come on over a memory module, then that memory module may not be seated correctly, and that's the one you should look at. That's the one that may be suspect. So say you turn your computer on and it's only seeing half or three quarters of the memory that you've installed, you can look at the LEDs and see what's up. Maybe I managed to get one installed backwards and managed not to fry anything. I don't know. If things are really messed up, you could read the debug code LED on the motherboard. So if it won't post or something is wrong or something like that, you can actually get a numeric readout. And the table of what those numeric codes mean is in the manual. Next up in the build is just a matter of attaching our 24 pin ATX power connector for the motherboard, our eight pin power connector for the CPU and our front USB 3.0. And there we go. With our motherboard mounted, now all we need to do is unpack our H115 from Corsair, mount that in there. Uh, add some case fans. I think we're probably going to need some case fans. I'm not sure if we're going to need a case fan in the top to help with the VRM area. We're going to try some tests. Maybe a case fan at the back, probably a case fan at the back, and some other stuff. So let's mount our CPU heatsink next, and then this thing will be ready to test. We've also got to install our M.2 drive, maybe some other PCI Express storage, I'm not real sure, and our graphics card, but we'll do all that last. The time has come for our all-in-one cooler. This is the Corsair H115i. This should be more than adequate for our needs, especially given that this thing is gonna, you know, dump upwards of 200 watts of heat into the area. Let's talk about heat production and uh, radiator placement. So we basically got two options. Maybe we can get it in the top of the case. I don't know if there's gonna be enough clearance for that. We can look at that. The top of the case, I think, is better. You gotta think about what's happening with the air. If you mount this in the top of the case, you can pull the air from the inside of the case through the radiator and exhaust the warm air out the top. So the heat in the radiator will be carried out the top of the case. This is pretty good, except that you get the air that has already been heated from the inside of the case, but it should lower the overall temperature of the case. The other option is to mount the radiator in the front, which will draw the very cool, hopefully, room temperature air from the front but the heat that's in the heat sink, the heat that's in the radiator of this, is going to be carried in the air to the inside of the case. And so you'll need some fans to uh, you know, finish the job and exhaust that air to the outside. Corsair, lovely five-year warranty, installation guide. We've got our two fans, our actual all-in-one, and then our installation hardware, which I almost always lose the installation hardware. Sometimes I try to reuse the all-in-one coolers on different systems for you know testing and whatever purposes, but I'm not real good at keeping up with the parts. Let's do a dry fit in the front of the case and see how that goes. Well, just doing a dry run in the top of the case, it doesn't fit, as, as pretty much expected. Uh, if the case were a little bit wider, it maybe could fit, but honestly, that's not really a big deal. Let's just put it in the front and see what happens. In order to mount it, we're gonna need the long screws. Let's turn this around so you guys can see. 
And there we go, it wasn't really too bad. It's just a matter of lining up the screws. Now I like to work corner to corner where I'm doing opposite corners on the fans and tighten it down that way. This is one of the easiest installations that I've had to do where the fans are sort of sandwiched between the radiator and the case. Sometimes I like to actually mount the fans on the other side of the radiator and then screw the radiator directly into the case just because it's so fiddly to try to wedge and sandwich everything in there. This actually went really well. Now with the radiator installed, it's really not a big deal. Uh, the next part is to just mount the actual heatsink part, this part, to the CPU. Now the interconnects here for the fans and power and all that stuff. I mean, uh, yeah, you gotta hook all that up. But really the next tricky part is this thing. And in order to do that, we have to use the standoffs. Now depending on what kind of CPU you have, you use different sets of standoffs that come with a CPU cooler because it's gotta support AM4, it's gotta support Z270, even the stuff before Z270. Uh, you know, you got a lot of different options. Probably not Threadripper, because Threadripper is the size of a small house. So, you're going to need larger heat sinks for that. But hey, live and learn. It's fine. So, we're going to mount these to the CPU socket and sort of go from there. Um, I'm going to uh, try to angle this so you guys can see what's going on inside the case. So, let's stand it up. Now, again, normally my recommendation would be to just do your work with the case horizontal, but I'm doing this for you guys. Doing it for you. I'm going to grab our four standoffs to make it really easy. Now comes the moment of truth. We're gonna press the pump, the water pump, that actually will carry the heat away from the little tiny copper heat sink inside the uh, water pump to the actual radiator. So let's do it. Now something I want you to pay attention to about the way that I install the water pump on the CPU is that you don't tighten down one corner all the way. You just tighten it down until you feel metal on metal and then you back off. It's still gonna be really loose. And then you go opposite corners tightening each corner down about a half turn to a quarter of a turn until you get them all tightened down. But it's very important that you do this so that you get an even pressure uh, applied to the CPU for maximum cooling. Now I know there's a Phillips head on these thumb screws and the temptation is gonna be to stick your screwdriver in there. Don't do it, don't do it. It should be pretty tight as far as it goes for like hand tightness, but you shouldn't use a screwdriver. That will over tighten it and you can't actually destroy the, the screws. Now we're gonna round up all the extra bits and put them back in the box in a futile attempt not to lose the parts. This is like a, the backplate that would go for like a Z270 motherboard if you're gonna install it with Z270. This is the AM4. We've got our CPU connection. So you can actually control this pump through USB. And so this little cable will plug into the water pump and then plug into one of our USB 2.0 headers on the motherboard. So I'll save that. Now the last step is to get the wires for our water pump hooked up. Now you'll notice that the Corsair uh, water pump does not use any of the powered water pump headers that modern motherboards offer. It's just got this little one wire thing. This is just a tachometer to let the motherboard know that yes, in fact, the pump is working and there is quote unquote a CPU fan installed. To actually power the pump, we need to use uh, a SATA style connector. So I've routed that through the top of the motherboard through one of the slots back there. We're gonna take the side off and deal with that. You can choose to control these fans through your motherboard's control software. In this case, I'm just gonna use the control from the water pump because that's the least complicated thing for me to worry about. Now this X299 system is gonna be for our testing and that means IOMMU testing and a whole bunch of other things. So I'm installing a USB 3.0 PCI Express adapter, a crappy secondary PCI Express video card, some other peripherals, a SATA hard drive, so that I can check the IOMMU groups on Linux and install the operating system and, and that sort of thing. Basically from here is just install your OS and run with it. Um, you'll have to wait for the motherboard review video for the full rundown, but the short version is the IOMMU group situation looks great on this motherboard. Everything is in its own container. Uh, Fedora 26 worked pretty well out of the box. I, I did have to fiddle with the, uh, the mixer, the audio mixer to get audio out, but once I fiddled with the mixer, uh, the rear panel audio worked fine. Everything else worked out of the box. The Intel Ethernet adapters, of course, SATA. The peripherals were exactly what I expected. And that's really pretty much it. I mean, this is also going to be the system we use for VRM testing. And preliminary testing is, yes, you do need a fan in the top. Um, so far, I've only, only overclocked the CPU as far as uh, 235 watts TDP, which is almost a 100 watt overclock. Um, but with that, I was able to hit 4.6 on all 10 cores, uh, which is really nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that's really, that's really pretty good. And that's with a 1.15 uh, volt V-core voltage. Uh, anything more than that in the CPU would, uh, would throttle 
uh, sort of prematurely, even though the temperatures were not really going past about 80 degrees C. And there you have it. That's our X299 build. This is the very first X299 system that I've built, and we're going to be using it for testing. And the reason we put it in a case instead of a test bench is to get real-world data on the whole VRM cooling situation. I really don't feel comfortable pushing my CPU much past 235 watts. Even that, I feel like, is really pushing it. But, you know, this motherboard was able to deliver that, and as long as the VRMs had some airflow over them, not even a lot of airflow, the temperatures were basically fine. But again, preliminary testing, you're going to have to wait for the full motherboard review, and we're going to dive into all that. So if you pick up one of these and you have experiences you want to share, uh, please do come to the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.